Coming up on Tech News Today, we can sneak you across the border to get you an unlocked iPhone. And if you got 300 bucks, we can help you streak. And Becky's got a secret. You've got to find out what it is. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, July 27, 2010. Tech News Today is brought to you by Carbonite. Backing up the files on your PC or Mac is safe and easy with Carbonite. For a free trial plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com. Offer code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Becky Worley. Behind the board is our subsequent producer... <laughs> Eric subsequent. No, that's the he, I'm the producer his, after myself. He's yeah. historical. He's historic. Oh, yeah. Historic. Wait, oh, okay. Historic, yes. Yeah. We know the difference now. Becky yes. called me because I said that the, uh, the, uh, the, what would I say? That the DMCA precedent was a, histor it was a historical precedent when I should have said it was a historic precedent. So we're starting with a correction today. Oh, that's, I'm just calling you out because I love to give you gas. <laughs> I hate it when I right. do that kind of stuff, too. <laughs> You know that's going to bother me now. <laughs> I'm never going to make that mistake again. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the difference, in case you're wondering, historical means that it is about history. Historic means it is history. We now know. So a historical TNT would be a TNT about the history of all 40 episodes of TNT. Whereas <laughs> a historic today TNT shall be a is historic today. One. Exactly. Starting with? StarCraft Two was out. Uh, I was too much of a wimp to hang around. Actually, I was just too sleepy to hang around and stay in line at my local game shop. Uh, but uh, it is out now. Plenty of people who did stay in line have it. They're playing it. Uh, most of them love it. And it is historic because it's been 12 years in the making. I watched the trailer. It was beautiful. Um, and it really seems like a true saga. Um, what's your experience with the, the story and how it's going to evolve over time? Yeah, so this is uh, this is Wings of Liberty. Uh, this is the first release. And then later they will add Heart of the Swarm, Legacy of the Void. Each one concentrates on a story told from one of the races in the game. I've been playing the beta and really enjoying it, as I, as I like this kind of real-time strategy sort of element to it. Uh, I don't like playing online so much because everyone's better than me. Uh, and so I just get my ass whooped every time I try to play online. Because these are people who've been playing StarCraft since they were babies. Uh, and whereas I never played StarCraft 1. I noticed in the trailer my favorite part was when some guy goes, Sweet mother of mercy. And I just want that to be kind of a tagline that, that, that we use for the whole show, that all stories are that historic that we need to say, Sweet mother of mercy. But I now have my consumer reporter secret you to reveal to you about StarCraft 2. You did not reveal to me this secret about StarCraft 2, which no. has soured our relationship a little. I'm telling you now, right. Kmart will give you a $20 in-store credit mm -hmm. if you purchase StarCraft 2 from them. Do you think you had, they have any left? I called, and they don't. No, I, <laughs> I just called some of the local stores, and they are sold out. Yeah. But this is through uh, 731, oh, okay. so they will be restocking. Gotcha. And you can use it for other purchases in the gaming movie world at Kmart, not all through the store. But basically, it's a 20 bucks off the seven seventy nine dollars that's the standard version. It looks like $99 for the full version, the uh, collector's edition, if you will. Only in-store? Only in-store, not online. Not online. All right. I want the collector's edition. Yeah. Because it gives you Warcraft pets. Oh, who knew? Yeah. Uh, also at Kmart, uh, and also apparently sold out, is a new Android tablet for 150 bucks. Yeah, this is a real sleeper of a release. Um, an Android tablet for $159 that just came out at Kmart only, but sold out and uh, has been a popular pre-release with not much fanfare. Yeah, 256 megabytes of RAM, Android 2.1, Wi-Fi, 2 gigs of storage, um, just $149.99, and it says it will have access to the Android app store. Uh, so, I don't know, kind of a nice little 7-inch tablet. I haven't played with it, though, so... Could be uh, could be slow or something. I don't know. Could could be anything. You know, the other thing interesting here, Walmart had the iPhone, Kmart with this Android tablet. 
I just think that we're going to see these mass retailers being a distribution channel for a lot of tech products that we're used to seeing, you know, barely in Best Buy. Things are really widening out in, in the retail space here. That's the march of progress. We re remember when Walmart started selling computers. Ooh. It was a big deal. You know, like, wow. And this was in the 90s, right? It's like, oh, you don't have to go to Computer City or, you know, the Best Buy. You can actually get a computer at Walmart now. That's crazy. Yeah. And so this is, we're, we're hitting that stage with tablets and, and smartphones. And, and there's little left in the tech world that hasn't passed into the mainstream when you think about it. It's all DIY stuff that, that isn't over there if, you, if now that we have tablets over there. Yep. Now, also new computers coming out today from Apple. Yes. So we have a, uh, a huge line of Apple stuff. Uh, and honestly, it's really not that big of a news day or else I, th I think, uh, you know, some new stuff from Apple wouldn't be that big a deal. But it's been a couple years uh, that they haven't changed the design on the Mac Pro. So everyone was excited for this next rev to see what they did. What did they do with the Mac Pro? Twelve cores uh, okay that's that's pretty that's pretty cool that's some, some pretty good uh, processing power in there if you can if you can take advantage of it which i it's guess high-end stuff can. video professionals you can see yep. video and uh, photography professionals really getting into this so the macbook will you the macbook will start with a quad core and a six core Mac in, pro. yeah macbook pro right Mac, Mac, Pro. Mac Pro. Sorry, yeah. sorry, 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 sorry. It's hard, Mac. hard not to do that mac pro Go ahead. yeah because it's been so long since we talked about mac the mac pro, pro. <laughs> it's historical uh, yes. See, you guys get to correct me here. The Mac Pro. Thank you so much. Quad core, six core Intel Xeon processor speeds up to 3.33 gigahertz. Get this, 12 megabytes of level three ca of L3 cache. Um, solid state drives. You can install up to four 512 gigabyte SSDs in a single Mac Pro. Uh, starts at 24.99. And goes all the way up 3500 for the 8 core. And I didn't see a price for the 12 core. They'll ship in August, according to Apple. And the, uh, the design, the new look of the Mac Pro, <laughs> exactly <laughs> like the old one. <laughs> Why mess with perfection? And historical design. That's it is right. a historical design. That's true. That's right. Well, uh, substance, we not all, style. What we also shocker. got new iMacs. That's right. Uh, iMacs, um, we're looking at a 21 and a half inch iMac starting at 1200 bucks. Core i3, 3 gigahertz processors. Then we have the 27-inch iMac, 2.8 gigahertz, quad-core, Intel Core i5s, 2,000 bucks. All right. You digest all that, huh? I'm, I'm, huh? I'm, I'm cool with that. Not, not as big of an iMac fan, so I guess it's not exciting me. But iMac fans are probably going to be excited. Uh, but something that's a little bit of a step back is the monitor. It's a, it's a step forward and a step back at the same time. Right. So there used to be a 24-inch and a 30-inch cinema display. Now we're looking at one 27-inch monitor, and the 30 inches are be, 30 inches are being sold on a while supplies last basis. So if you want them, go get them. How Apple is that? Like 27 inches is really good enough. You don't need a bigger screen. Well, than that. you know how they are. They want to keep those skews down to a minimum. This yeah. is actually reducing the line. Well, right. well, you know what the difference is, right? This is this is the 16 by 9 equivalent of. The 30 inch. The 30 inch was, was a 16 three. by 10. Oh, and that, so this is, they just lopped off a little bit at the top and bottom. Cinema. Full cinema. Let's move on to the more exciting uh, versions. The magic trackpad that we speculated might or might not come when we talked about it yesterday is in fact arriving. Right. I'm excited about this because if you are someone who uses the gestures on a laptop, having a, 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 a trackpad that you can connect via Bluetooth to your desktop will give you the power of gestures. Do you use that? I am addicted. So let me, for people who haven't um, seen or used gestures on trackpads with Macs, the way this works is if you go into the upper left-hand corner of your trackpad, it minimizes all the windows and shows you everything that's open. You go to another corner, it just takes you straight to your desktop. When you're scrolling through websites, you can use two fingers up or down, and it very cleanly and seamlessly navigates the page for you, unlike the way it works with trackpads on many Windows machines. I think that this is something that is, when I have to switch over to a PC, it takes me five or 10 minutes to adjust. Even though I know every keyboard shortcut for Windows, it's still gestures are far and away the most efficient way to work a computer. See, I'm on the opposite. I, I don't use any of those gestures on the trackpad. In fact, I kind of hate not having an actual mouse. When I, when I get home or when I get upstairs to the desk, I, first thing I do is plug in the mouse. 
because I, I just built up that memory there. Uh, I just need to go through a little trackpad training, I guess. I think IO is very much something that people feel personal and and, yeah. and, and that it's very innate to them. On to the battery charger, the last of the new uh, products. And as boring as that may sound, kind of the coolest one. It might be. It's $29. It comes with six rechargeable uh, AA nickel metal hydride batteries. Apple says that these batteries will get 10 years of life out of them. And so if you're thinking about all the wireless devices now that are connected to these desktops, this is a natural um, product announcement to come with the desktop uh, re-up. And I think this is really neat. They they believe very strongly in their green mission, and kudos to Apple for coming out with something different. So anything like a keyboard or a mouse or a magic trackpad that uses the AA batteries, uh, now Apple has its own battery recharger. Uh, wh what's exciting about this to me is the batteries themselves, if they live up to those expectations. And one thing, you know, whatever you think of Apple, they have actually been conservative in battery life estimates in the past. Uh, when I worked at CNET, the labs guys were like, you know, the only people who really come in at, at or above what their estimates were is Apple. So if that's true of these batteries, that's pretty cool. Uh, and, and I wouldn't mind paying a little bit of a price for that. Can and you buy additional batteries to use in other devices? You just have the six that come with it. I'm, I don't know the, the answer to that, but you would think that it would come with additional ones. And the other thing to say about this is the draw on power is much smaller. So their battery charger uses only 30 milliwatts, and you compare that to other of these chargers, which is more like 300 milliwatts in the same setting. So, you know, Apple's really, really moving forward. And this is not sexy, but it's great. $29, by the way, for the charger, which comes with the six batteries. So it's, you know, it's, it's not that, it's like Apple. It's not, it's a little more expensive maybe, right. but it's not that much more expensive. And I'm trying to see here if they, they'll sell me just the batteries. And I'll work on that while you go on. It doesn't but, but you can use the charger with any nickel metal hydride batteries, not just Apple's. Any, any rechargeable. Yeah, yeah. On to the Dell Streak. That's why they call it the Streak, because it's hard to find. Uh, and Gadget? reporting that they will retail for $299 with a contract or $549 without. Uh, the problem with the streak, though, is uh, they got this information from a Dell blog posting that immediately went away. Mm. Uh, so these facts may have been premature or they may have been leaked. It'll also be available on August 9th for $99.99. Uh, I'm sorry, the Arrow will also be available on August 9th for $99.99 with a contract and $299.99 without. Now, some of the criticism of this was that in the UK, if you get the Dell Streak with O2, the provider there, you're paying 25 pounds a month, which is about 45, or depending on the exchange rate, bucks a month, but you get the Streak for free. So, 299. Some people are saying, "Hey, what's up with that?" Dell has been taking pre-sale orders for the Dell Streak, where you didn't get the price yet. You just said, "I will definitely buy one," uh, and people who did the pre-order would be first in line. They'll get an email to buy the streak before it goes on sale to everybody else. So we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye out on that one. Uh, students trust the first search term that is returned in Google, no matter what. <laughs> According to a story uh, printed in the International Journal of Communication, research comes out of Northwestern University, go Wildcats, uh, students don't care about anything except the search engine. They, they say, look, I trust the search engine, so whatever comes up first in the search engine results, that's what I buy. I don't look at the URL. I don't look at the author. I don't look at any of the other search terms. They also said that they seemed to not to have a great sense of discretion when it came to uh, the domain from which the information came, that they trusted .gov or .edu slightly more than .coms or .orgs, but had no idea that .orgs weren't sanctioned as nonprofits or you right. know, anybody they, could purchase one. They said, oh, yeah, I trust those non-commercial sites like .gov, .edu, and .org. Right. And then people, and then the, the researchers were like, well, you know, .org can be, uh, can be uh, registered by anybody. .org isn't like .gov and .edu, to which they found out that their subjects did not know that. Right. So, and this is just like the Wikipedia story when Wikipedia first came out. It's like, come on, kids. Just a little bit of research. Just a little bit of primary research. Come you know, on. and it's not even that. For me, it's the idea of, of when you look at a page of search results, you look at the whole page. I almost never look at the first result. <laughs> In fact, I have a bias against the first result because it's <laughs> it's usually not what I'm looking for. It's usually wrong. I, I always go down farther in the page and usually click through two or three pages if I don't find what I'm looking for exactly right off the first. So Tom, this, this Tom, idea... Tom, Tom clicks the I'm feeling negative button. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
I'm feeling <laughs> unlucky. Okay, here's a totally non sequitur question. But do you ever, if you see a result in your search and then you see the same result that's an ad, which one do you click? Oh, I always click the result, not the ad. Oh, see, I always click the ad because I want them to think that their advertising works and I want them to feel good about the advertising. Isn't yeah. that terrible? I always want to validate the search engine. They're like, no, you you did the work. They're just riding on your coattails. Maybe it's because I'm in media and I know that my, my dinner is put on the table by advertisers. Yeah, so I don't know if I'm... the difference between you and me. <laughs> I'm biting that hand. Stop feeding me. All right. Speaking of which, this episode is brought to you by Carbonite, <laughs> the leader in online Good backup. Uh, I use it. It's running right now on my MacBook Pro. Uh, unexpected computer disasters happen all the time. So you want to not be caught out. This is an important thing. So so don't you know, forget that this is just an ad. It's important to back up whatever way you do it because your data is more and more important all the time and you should have it backed up in multiple ways. Carbonite provides the best way to back up online. It's safe and easy, works for PC and Mac, protects all of those valuable files on your computer. Uh, it's safe. Your files are encrypted before they leave your computer for maximum security uh, and it's easy. You, you can set it up in your sleep. I mean, in fact, I did. <laughs> I was a little sleepy. I actually wasn't asleep, but uh, it's really easy to set up. And not only does it back up your data and keep you safe, but it also provides a side benefit of being to access your data elsewhere. So if you're not on your computer, you can actually go to the web and you can find your files that are backed up and get access to them that way. And I got to tell you, you know what, what season it is? Nobody wants to admit it. It's back to school season. And if you're sending your young, just graduated high school senior off to college, Put the carbonite on the laptop because you don't want to have the, I can't get my data. Exactly. It's back up to school season. Oh, <laughs> chum. So something like this you might think is going to run you a lot of money, but it's really only 15 cents a day. PC or Mac, 55 bucks a year. And you don't have to pay anything to try it. Go to carbonite.com and enter the offer code TNT. You'll get a free trial. And if you decide to buy the service, They'll throw in two months free with the offer code TNT. So be sure to sign up for the free trial from the homepage. Get the two months free. You don't need a credit card to try the thing out. Just enter the code, enter your name, download the software, install it, give it a shot. That's Carbonite.com. Offer code TNT. Now, be careful where you're moving your mouse at all times while using Google because they have now patented search results based on how you move your mouse cursor on screen. So in order to track your thoughts, your movements, your proclivities, not only your search terms and your clicks, but just where you hover your mouse. Because it's another data point that tells them what you're interested in. So if you're hovering your mouse over a link to look at it and go, hey, where does that link go to? I'm looking in the I'm looking down there. Oh, it's techguy.net. Okay, well, I don't really know that, man. man. Maybe I won't click in. They know, oh, they're interested in those words. That's why they're hovering over it. So... This is another way for them to provide relevant search results and ads based on that behavior. But on the other side, it's more ways to find out personal information about you that you have to trust that Google's going to use responsibly. I, I also, I mean, there's a lot of facets to this story. So number one, I had no idea that I actually did this, that where my eyes were going, my mouse followed. Uh -huh. I didn't realize it. I've noticed it with my dad because his mouse pointer is about the size of my arm. But, you know, like I... I just really realized that that's how you, that's how you work. You, you scroll with your mouse and your eyes at the same time. Secondly, eye tracking is a huge resource and research tool for many uh, technology companies. And I wonder if this will also be sort of a, a side revenue stream if they use this as a research mechanism that they can then outsource and sell. And then the privacy issues. So my concern is, what I'm doing on my computer, when I click, I perceive that is sending data. That is my choice. I perceive my mouse movements to be passive and personal. I, I didn't even really realize this, but I, I, clicking is like submitting your credit card. That's right. when you know you're doing the deed of communicating. There's a physical aspects to it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, this feels weird. Although, you know what? You should think of mousing over as sending data because on mouse over is is a great way to steal data from you. Uh, there's all kinds of, of JavaScript and other mm. script ways to read what's going on with your mouse cursor uh, that can be used on, on malicious web pages. So what Google's patenting here is just how to collect and, and interpret those results 
Uh, but it, but it's a good thing to know that you know when you're when you're on the internet, there's lots of ways you're sending information, not just when you're actually doing something. They submitted for this patent 2005. So this is long in the works, and I think that um, this is just the tip of an iceberg of a story that's going to evolve. It's the tool tip of an iceberg. Ooh. On to the fastest ISP in the U.S. Uh, we've got the uh, metrics from Ookla. They run speedtest.net, mm -hmm. which has kind of become my default way to check speed. I used to, I used to just go to broadbandreports.com and then click through. I like their speed thing. I like their speed test now mm. still, but it's easier to remember speedtest.net and then they have the app that I use on the iPhone. And according to the metrics that they have collected, Comcast has the fastest internet in the United States at an average speed of 16.23 megabits per second. Charter is number two. Optimum Online, which is known as Cablevision in a lot of places, 14.39 and on down the road. Interestingly, Verizon way down at the bottom, 10.77, but they say that's because their fast Fios service is outweighed by their slow DSL service. Right. So, and, and that's, you know, it's an interesting thing with Comcast, which has some fast Doxus 3.0 systems around the country that are only available for business, but enough businesses use them and use speed test that could help raise their average. So, what did you get at your new place? I got Comcast business. Right. And what are your up, what are your up speeds? Uh, 50 down and 10 up. Yeah. So I have regular and I'm getting 10 up. 10 up. What's your down? Uh, I think it's uh, 18, 20. Okay. Yeah. So, but I, but I only care about up. I only care about moving to South Korea because they have 31.38 <laughs> megabits per second. Uh, now, here, here's the, Ars Technica did a good job of explaining this because a lot of people say, well, okay, South Korea is a smaller country, so it's easier for them to roll out stuff. But when you dig into this uh, speed test data, you find out that even if you just go city by city, Seoul, South Korea gets 31.7 megabits per second, blowing away every single city in both California and New York. Mm. So... If you compare equal-sized areas, they're still way ahead of us. Uh, and, and the United States overall is 27th in speed in the world. You should also go check out Business Insider has a great story today about the worst places in America for broadband. And it's a lot of it's in the South. It's obviously tied to areas that have high poverty. And the infrastructure has absolutely not been built out. But it's, it's interesting to see where those counties are that just got totally left behind. Yeah. Uh, it's it's bad enough that the United States is so slow overall. It means that the slowest places in the United States are that much slower. On to the lightning round. Uh, these are just a few stories that we'd like to pass along some info with you. We don't have that much to say about them. They're just important nuggets to know. Go. You start. Okay. AT&T is going to issue a fix for slow iPhone upload speeds. The carriers confirmed a glitch in its back-end equipment that creates slow upload speeds for less than 2% of users, it says. So they say. Uh-huh. And they'll implement a fix in the next few weeks to resume normal upload speeds. Here's an example of a company that actually understands how to keep customers happy rather than blaming them. A recent glitch caused 12,000 Modern Warfare 2 players on Steam to be banned for no apparent reason. Valve, the makers of Modern Warfare 2, admit the glitch was their fault, have unbanned the players, and have given them all a free copy of their other game, Left 4 Dead 2. The Chevy Volt's pricing was announced today. The plug-in gas hybrid will retail for $41,000. Now that's $14,000 less than the 65K Tesla Model S, which is aimed at a similar consumer segment. They're all aimed above me. Mm -hmm. And Gadget reports that after checking stock inventories at T-Mobile USA, Amazon, and a few others, the T-Mobile G1, the world's first Android handset, is no longer for sale. It is survived by its younger brother, the Nexus... Oh, wait, that one's not available either. It's survived by a bunch of Android phones. Yahoo Japan has announced that they will use Google Search instead of Yahoo's new official BFF, Bing. Citing Google's Japanese language advantages, Yahoo tells the Redmond folks, hey, don't take it personally. We still love you, but only in the U.S. Uh, yeah, you know, Yahoo Japan is not owned by Yahoo. Well, it's owned in part by Yahoo, but it's a minority part. The majority of Yahoo Japan is owned by SoftBank. Oh, yeah. Didn't they used to own us? They used to own ZDTV, which owned us. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, so, yeah, so they can kind of do whatever they want. Yeah. They're, just kind of, they're almost just licensing the name. At that point, Yahoo's like a minority stockholder. 
it's, in Yahoo Japan. But it is still a slap to Microsoft, and they're, and they're yeah. hurt. They're hurt. They're feeling bad. I've always wondered that because there have been some Yahoo Japan stuff that I, I've tried to use, and I've tried to log in, and they're like, no, your login doesn't work here, dude. Hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, baseball. Baseball. You, you, can get the, mm -hmm. uh, you can get the online Japanese baseball stuff. It's very, very good to me. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have one final uh, funny story before we get to the calendar. A uh, new study uh, purports to show that iPad owners are a bunch of selfish bastards. Or at least that's what people think of them. I, that's what people think of me, yes, because I am an iPad owner. Well, it's almost like carrying a Louis Vuitton purse, which I know you also do. Yeah, well, I carry my iPad in my Louis Vuitton purse. I like that about that it. That just makes it doubly, it's like the multiplier effect. It's a man pouch, Tom. Not mine. <laughs> it's a Louis Vuitton. Jeez. <laughs> uh, consumer research for my type conducted the study in which opinions of 20,000 people were analyzed between March and May. The firm's conclusion was that iPad owners tend to be wealthy, sophisticated, highly educated, and disproportionately interested in business and finance, while they scored terribly in the areas of altruism and kindness. In other words, selfish elites. Mm-hmm. Now, we saw some data a few weeks ago that the iPad owners are actually just 40-year-old men. That's the, the kind of the rounding out of who they are. Um, but this is the percent. I, I just want to give you guys each, you know, just a buck. Just just because, you know. Uh, I need more. Just to be kind. I care about a lot of money. So, hey, I don't got that much. Well, you know what? <laughs> I have an iPad too, so take it back. God, we're seeming like such fanboys today. I do feel self-conscious taking it out, though. Um, it seems like overkill sometimes. I was in the dentist's office, and I had to make my next appointment. And when I busted out my iPad, I wanted to crawl under the counter. Yeah. Well, it's always when you're an early adopter. When I remember when I first had the very first iPhone, I wouldn't take it out on the bus. And now, everybody's got them. You know, it's, it's not a big deal. But whenever you're the first person, you always feel a little dumb pulling that thing out. Well, now we know you're an elitist Snob. Who's willing to give out a dollar <laughs> only to his exactly. hardworking colleague. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go on to the calendar. What do we, sure, what do we got, got a bunch of stuff. Uh, hackers flocking to Black Hat, DEF CON this week in Las Vegas. Caesars Palace happening there. Harry Chaps and all. Uh, Apple is going to sell the iPhone 4 unlocked in Canada starting Friday. But get this, the 16 gigabyte unlocked version, 659 bones Canadian. 639 U.S. Yeah, U.S. and Canadian dollars are almost on par. That, that was a bigger uh, shock to me in the, <laughs> than, the, than the unlocked phone. But does that mean you could go across the border and buy an unlocked phone in Canada and just bring it back to the U.S., right? I don't see why not. Yeah. So, or, or trade it, bring some cigarettes over to them. Why not just jailbreak phone? it here? Yeah. Well, it's legal now. Yeah, yeah that's there true. You go. Uh, the iPhone 4 cases, the free ones that people were signing up post antenna gate, have started shipping as of Monday night. And finally, August 6th is the Blog Her conference in New York City for all you her bloggers out there, she bloggers. Uh, it's a bunch of chicks talking about talking not, online. Not herb bloggers. No, Herb Kane bloggers. Yeah, right. No. Or herb bloggers. No, no, that's a whole nother. What's that number? Four. Four, four, 405, what's the, the secret down low on the Pacalolo? I mean, what's the number? 260-TNT show <laughs> is our number. That you can call and leave voicemails like Seth did. Uh, he has a question about the whole DMCA exemption. Hey, guys, this is Seth from Northeast Indiana. Now, let me get this straight. Did the Library of Congress make it legal for me to make, up, make DVD backups of DVDs that I purchased? Or was this just a step in that direction. Love the show. Keep up good work. Bye. Uh, that's an interesting uh, question that uh, Eric and I were talking about before the show, actually, because no, just from the text of the DMCA exemption, it doesn't follow that you can back up your DVDs, right? Right. The text of the uh, uh, from the Librarian of Congress that came out yesterday said that it'll only allow short portions of motion pictures into works for the purpose of criticism, comment, uh, etc. So it has to be short. And the other the other thing that I hadn't hear haven't heard many people comment on is it is not allowable with Blu-rays and other forms of copy protection. Possibly not even Macrovision. It just says the CSS, the content scrambling system, and just with DVDs. Yeah, it's just the it's just DCSSing it. 
Uh, so those 14 lines of code or whatever that uh, allow you to, to pull off the CSS now legal for making mashups and making fair use and doing criticism and commentary. The way it's written does not give you the right to back up the whole thing. However, there's a lot of folks out there saying, well, they've left it open for you to go to court and fight for the right to back up the whole thing, saying... Well, the, yes, the way the Librarian of Congress wrote this exemption is such, but if you're going to give that fair use, because criticism and commentary is one of the factors of fair use, then I should also have the right to have this other fair use. So this could be a, a wedge into the ability to get that right somehow, even if it's mm. not explicitly stated. Or we can just wait another three years and see what incremental tiny, tiny changes they made. Right. People made this out to be a huge change in the law and policy and I think when you look at the practical application of how this was written, it's not as extensive as people wished it were wished who it want were, yeah. the kind of controls is, for content that we It was we a want. bigger change to have the district court in Louisiana say that you can, you can circumvent copyright in order to make fair use. And I think that's a better entree into being able to make DVD backups is if you can follow that precedent and say, hey... Louisiana District Court said, "I ha if I'm not breaking, co if I'm not infringing copyright, then I get to break encryption, and that would allow you to break encryption on Blu-ray." But that goes against every other court precedent, so it still remains to be seen how that gets fought out. That one's going to have to go all the way to the Supreme Court. This is just getting watching the sausage get made. Yeah. It's ugly. On to before, actually, before we get to the email, uh, we've had a few folks send us emails about the timing of the show. And we've talked about this before. Uh, we've, we've been getting the audio out faster. Eric's been busting his ass to do that. Uh, so hopefully the audio listeners are getting the show pretty quickly. Uh, I know it's posted by no later than 4.30 Pacific most of the time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I know that's still 7.30 Eastern time. But we were kind of having an internal conversation here of what else can we do to get it out earlier. And we're thinking, well, what if we moved it up a half hour? What if we just uh, started the show at 2 instead of 2.30? Uh, and that, that would get us getting the show. Effectively, we'd get the show out on demand a half hour earlier. Would that make any difference to you? We're trying to figure out who, who of you are listening on the East Coast as you drive home and you want to stream it live on your mobile device. And that's probably the best way that we can do this. And so we're trying to figure out the timing. Does that mean we start at 2.15? That gives you time to get out of the office and get in the car and, you know, fire up the live stream or 2.30 if we just had a hard start and did it every day. I mean, we're... Or are you like, you know what? I'm used to this time. It's fine. I figured it out. So anyway, send us a, uh, an email, tnt at twit.tv, and let us know. Even if you're saying it in the chat room right now, we can't properly pay attention. So send us an email <laughs> too uh, and let us know. First of all, would you like it to be moved up a half an hour? Uh, and second of all, is there an ideal time uh, that you wish it were at. And we're, and we're not promising we'll change it, but we'll, we'll, we'll listen. We aim to please. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go on to some emails. So, well, some of them were sent to TNT at twit.tv. This first one was actually uh, sent to tommerritt.com. And it comes from Steve who says, here's, update, here's an update on the Yankee Group info you mentioned yesterday. Looks like 11% of iPhone owners intend to buy another smartphone to answer your question. Looks like 33% of smartphone owners intend to buy an iPhone. And so I think what that means is 11% of iPhone owners intend to buy a different smartphone, not another iPhone. They plan to buy an Android phone or a BlackBerry or something else. Yeah, so that's this, a pretty small attrition rate for, for Apple. Yeah, and iPhone owners intend ten, ten, uh, iPhone owners intend to stick with Apple. Significant numbers of non-iPhone owners intend to buy iPhone. So uh, no other manufacturer can claim nearly the loyalty of the iPhone owners. That all comes from Carl Howe posting on the Yankee Group blog in the link sent to us by Steve. So thanks for sending that along. Rich in lovely Cleveland writes, Tom and Posse. I'm wondering if the recent fair use ruling allowing the breaking of encryption as long as copyright is not violated will affect the legality of Hackintoshes to some degree. Consider you buy a Mac and a bunch of software and your motherboard gets fried you still have the license to use the OS and the software that's on the hard drive. Would it then be legal to construct a Hackintosh for the purposes of accessing those applications that you've purchased a license for? I realize this would break Apple's TOS, but does it open the door um, for the discussion? And this seems very parallel to the dongle issue. Yes. That was the, the, the basis of this ruling in the, in the Fifth Circuit, right? Yeah. And, and let's set aside for a moment what we said earlier about this is actually going to have to be fought out to the Supreme Court because we have conflicting precedents. I don't think that even if the Louisiana court 
uh, precedent ends up being the sta the standing rule for everyone. If the Supreme Court says, yes, that's exactly the way the law should be, it doesn't save you because of the same thing that the jailbreaking exemption with the DMCA doesn't save you. You're still violating the terms of service of Apple. So you're not breaking the law when you jailbreak an iPhone, but you're breaking the terms of service. So Apple could sue the makers of the jailbreaking software, and they definitely do not have to honor a warranty. I think the same thing would happen with the Hackintosh. They could still go after you for breaking the terms of service. Of You know, you bought that piece of software from them, and the software explicitly said you cannot do this with it. You cannot put it on a non-Apple computer. It doesn't change that. It does take away one weapon. They can't also sue you for breaking copyright. Because mm -hmm. you may be able to say, well, I, ha I should have the fair use to do this. But, of course, the fear of Apple bricking your device with a future software update is still totally valid. Yeah, they can still do that. Yeah. And may. <laughs> likely will. Actually, I don't, I, I don't believe that Apple bricks jailbreak phones or, or bricks Hackintoshes on purpose. I think they just consciously do not pay any attention to that. And, and so if you're not paying attention to something, you know from anybody who's done user testing knows that law of unintended consequences will almost always break something if you're not paying attention to it. Right. Precedent and uh, future business models, I think, what are at stake. Basically. Finally, Phil wrote in and said, I'm driving to work, listening to TNT. I stopped at a rest area so that I could send this note. I applaud Phil for not texting while driving or trying to email us while driving. Uh, he says you should check out Tree Style Tabs. It lists the tabs down the left side and supports nesting tabs. So this is an answer to uh, my wish for Candy, Firefox's new way of managing tabs. I'm going to try this out. Add-ons.mozilla.org, add-on uh, add 5890. I couldn't find a, uh, an easier link, but we'll put it in the show notes at uh, twit.tv slash TNT. So tree-style tabs, it puts all the tabs under other tabs and makes a little left-side menu that you can pull up when you want. I kind of like it. I'm going to try it out. And, uh, and a listener who's so passionate about the information that he needed to pull over and send an email. Yes. We are grateful for that kind of engagement, please. Thank, thank you, you for being a fan and responsible, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you're all fans and responsible. Uh, and you can let us know at TNT at twit.tv or by giving us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. It's a free call in Butler, Indiana. Tolls may apply elsewhere. And you can also find us on the web, TNT or twit.tv slash TNT. I'll see you later. Bye. Dang good music.